beaten track to find solutions. This is our look ahead at round five of the Absa Off-Road Championship and the FIA African Heritage Cross Country and Amatola 500 race in East London in the Eastern Cape. For brothers Henry and Maurice Matten, the off-road racing scene inevitably led them to a place where they started their own company and how it has grown since. Zermatten is a world record holder for consecutive off-road races finished and their large sheet metal tooling company in Alberton on the East Rand has given both the Zermattens the freedom to race and that they do equally well. Their flying class d Roby Nissan Hardbody is a crowd favourite and they know it. We, uh, with my brother, myself and my wife, we run a company called Manrepco. We specialise in tooling for the sheet metal industry, such as guillotine blades and uh, blades to bend sheet metal. And basically any company that uh, would work sheet metal in, in the whole of Africa would at some stage have used tooling that either was made by us or made for a manufacturer and then shipped to them. So it uh, started quite small, 10 rand off the dining room table one day. And uh, I, I ran foul of my, my then boss who said uh, that he wouldn't want me to take my leave in one day at a time because I was racing for Toyota at the time. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, no, you must take all 15 days in December. I said, that doesn't suit me. We need to race once a month. And uh, big boxing match, eventually I said to him, listen, you know what, I'm going to start my own company. At least I can go racing when I want to. And that's pretty much how the business started. Indeed, Zermatten started at the tender age of just 15 in a do-it-yourself fashion, if you like. I bought a Land Rover when I was 15 for 150 bucks. It was a real basket case that came in a box of parts. And I uh, spent a few years putting it back together again to see if I could. And uh, took it down to the coast when, I was, when it was all running. And uh, it was an epic journey. It took me two days to get there and another two days to get back. It was probably the worst holiday of my life. I never used it again, but I never got rid of it either. I just parked it in the garden under a tree. And uh, now that there's a bit more time, okay, I've actually now built a little garage for it with uh, underfloor heating, tiled floors, all the stuff to make life easy. And uh, the plan is that with my son now, we're going to restore it and get it back to a working condition. But now I want to do it a little better than I did when I was younger. So fortunately, it's still there and we didn't make too many mistakes when we uh, put it together the first time so it's not going to be a lot of work but just take a bit of time and how did their world record in their old pajero come about was it just consistency yeah i think that's probably been a product of uh, having no budget so we had to be very careful with the car and we drove it well within its capabilities we had a good car in the pajero um, without backing from the factory no help whatsoever we ran the whole team out of our back pocket basically uh, help from mastercraft and Ryobi, so that kept things running nicely um, and we were careful you know we obviously just made sure that we didn't break anything and that gave us 21 consecutive uh, finishes uh, which i hear later is a world record in, in actually in most forms of motorsport not just in off-road and then uh, we gave it up at the uh, a year ago exactly to take a sabbatical because the business was growing at a fairly phenomenal rate and uh, we decided, listen, you know what, that still pays for the bread. So we had to concentrate on the business for a year, and uh, it's, it's fine, it's doing very well. And uh, then Nissan phoned us and said, hey guys, we've still got a, a Class D Bucky X Alfie Cox that's, uh, that's basically looking for a home. Would we be prepared to race it? And we said, we'd be the greatest of pleasure. So we parked the Pajero, got started with a Nissan, but it's been a bit of a learning curve because the two vehicles are Obviously, the Nissan's a lot more competitive. She's faster, um, but it needed a lot of maintenance, you know, to get it back up to racing speed again. How did they find their feet in the newer, faster car? And how did it go between the two brothers then? What we did was um, we did the one of the regionals just to make sure that we were right on the money in terms of pace and talking to each other again. And yeah, it was rusty. Yeah? It was lefts and rights were getting mixed up and gear changes being missed. Um, but it certainly wasn't anything that slowed us down much. You know, it was one of those things. You yell at each other a little bit in the cab, you know, but um, we found that we've, in every single race this year, we've been, except for Sun City, we've been uh, right on the money. In fact, we've been, uh, the first race, we, we were right in front. I mean, we were like 15 minutes ahead of the rest of the pack in Class D. 
when uh, the, the bearings let go on the motor. So I find the pace is there. We, there's no problem as far as that's concerned. The vehicle's quick enough. Uh, it's just been a few reliability issues, and we had a little coming together at Schlesluri, which meant we had to rebuild the back end of the car. Uh, so it's been circumstances rather than uh, any particular reason that we haven't been up front. I still believe we have a good shot at getting the championship if we, uh, if we just get it together now. And it's just been one of those things, you know, a bit of bad luck here and a bit of an oops there. And you look again and then you've got three DNFs, which for us was an absolute shocker. The three did not finish as despite. Tell us about your BMW experience in the daunting Dakar rally. Yeah, that's an interesting one. When uh, I was invited by BMW Germany or the BMW Dakar team to join them and I've done two Dakars with them driving their service vehicle, their service truck. And uh, whenever something is needed to be done in the team or something and you come up with a suggestion, they'll, they'll look at you and they say, oh, are you from Africa? What do you guys in Africa know? You know, they have this real uh, superior attitude in, in Europe. And especially if you come from Africa, they, they call you uh, bush cats, you know, what do you know? And uh, it'll be interesting now because now we're actually going to race head to head with the same team that I, that I work for when we, uh, when we do Dakar. And it should make for a good party after the event, but I think during the event there's going to be a lot of chirping, and uh, that, that should be a lot of fun, I think. And you'll see all of that right here on Supersport, but what are the Zamatans' chances of winning? Our chances of winning it are very, very slim, but we're not there to win it. What we're there to do is to see how far off the pace we really are. Um, our, our aim, Maurice and myself, at some stage is to do the Dakar in, uh, in a vehicle and we'll obviously be facing against, we'll be facing the same teams, Ivor Tollefson, Mark Corbett, uh, the BMW teams and it always gives you a good indication of whether a standard car is so much slower than a purpose-built race car. I don't think it is. I don't think there's going to be as much difference as people think. Um, but it's going to be fun. For us it's just to see how far off the pace are we or are we right on the money. One team that has been right on the money has been Nissan, who will be looking for their fifth win in a row in the production vehicle category this season on the Amatola 500. The Eastern Cape outing is indeed two races in one, with the 500 round five of the APSA Off-Road Championship run in conjunction with the African Heritage Cross Country, which is round two of the FIA Cross Country World Cup. So far this season, the factory Nissan team has scored a clean sweep with two wins apiece to reigning champions Hannes Krobler and Francois Jordan and Duncan Foss, who will be reunited with co-driver Ralph Pitchford, who missed the Toyota 1000 Desert Race. In Pitchford's absence, veteran Richard Leek partnered Foss to a Botswana win that took Foss to the top of the Drivers' Championship. Krobler and Jordan and Foss with Pitchford will certainly be amongst the pre-race favourites. But apart from the two factory cars, Nissan have strong challenges in Norwegian Tollefsen and his co-driver, the Brit Quinn Evans, in another factory Navara. And, of course, Corbett and Balzar in the Century Property Development Nissan Navara. Tollefsen and Evans and Corbett, coupled with Balzar, have also entered the African Heritage races. Both crews could concentrate more on good finishes in the World Cup than in the local event, but Nissan are well equipped for a fifth consecutive win and continued domination of the super production class. However, both the Castle Toyota Hilux squad and the Ford Racing Ranger factory and privateer team are itching to put an end to the Nissan run. There's plenty of quality in both stables, and Toyota pair Mark Rooney and Chris Birkin will feel hard done by after coming so close to a win on the recent Toyota 1000 Desert Race in Botswana. Bevan Berthold and Robin Houghton in a second factory entry will be hoping to turn around a season to forget thus far, while works newcomers Chris Fisser and his co Yapi Bardnost will go all out to consolidate on an impressive performance in the Botswana dust. Hichu and Yap de Brain in the Nicker and Exel Toyota Hilux led the Toyota 1000 for long periods and will take plenty of encouragement from that performance. On the Ford front, factory pair former champions Neil Woolridge and Kenny Schulthammer will be looking for a return to form. Their teammates Brandon Harkis and Jean Moore appear to be settling down very nicely. And the vastly experienced Manfred Schroeder and Ward Huxtable combination will be a threat in the Barlow World Entry 2. <laughs> Kubis van Tonda and Rian Graupa also had a good first outing in the X-Works Unifrank Ford Ranger in Botswana. 
with a good mix of factory and privateer entries, the SP class is now chock a block full of quality, and the Nissan Brigade will come under plenty of pressure. There will also be plenty of pressure in Class D, where some intense championship battles have developed. Consistency has taken Harold and Tian Kun in a Land Rover to the top of the championship, where they are being chased down by Yuri and Andre Duplessis in a BB Auto Nissan hard body, as well as impressive newcomers from On Beside Note and Stefan Locke in a Toyota Hilux. Involved in the championship fight are Arnold Duplessis and Johan Knox in yet another BB Auto Nissan. And Gretziel Avaskachny with Johan Gerber in the Raysonics Nissan hard body. The winners in the Eastern Cape, however, could very well come from either Botswana winners Henry and Maurice Matten in the Raobi Nissan hard body. Or the Weichelts in the Bosel Toyota Hilux who are due a win. The Zermattens, the Weichelts and the Beside Note Lock Dio have also entered the African Heritage Invitation event. All this really means is that their dogfight is bound to last more than two days. Pressure will also be very much in evidence in Class E, where only a handful of points separate just five crews. Jack Beckham and Lucio Santoro in the Ford Racing Ranger lead the class by a single point from Botswana winners George and Sharon Balkhazen in their Roacon Toyota Hilux. On their tails are Castrol Toyota Hilux crew Brian Martin and Oki Furi. With Yanni Fissa and Jox Leroux in the Team Barber Spawn Toyota Hilux. Any of the top crews could sneak the win with Thomas Rundle and Brian Roberts in the Barden Tire Services Nissan Hardbody also in with a chance of an upset. The fight for overall land class honours will produce some fascinating racing and the scenery in the Amatole Mountains should be dramatic. Add all of this together with a fast route and a big battle for points and it spells potential for drama. And adding to all that high drama is the fact that the championship race in the special category is very delicately poised. Championship leaders Nick and Ryan Harper in the Atlas Copco Bat are just 10 points clear of Evan Hutchison and Akim Bergman in the black and silver motorite bat, who in turn are just three points ahead of Shamir Varayawa and Siegfried Rousseau in the total motorsport porter. Also in the championship mix are reigning champions Alfie Cox and Hini Tersteche in the second motorite bat, who, like Hutchison and Bergman, and the Harpers already feature amongst the race winners this season. The other winning crew, father and son, Carl Heinz and Quinton Silwalt, with a Silwalt Transport Zarko, have certainly lifted their game to another level. Bariawa and Rousseau have also been threatening a win all season and will fancy their chances this time round. But to be truthful, there's a long list of potential winners. Gary Bertolt and Jeff Minnett, standing in for Henry Castain in the second Atlas Copco Porter, have the pace, but reliability has been a problem. While Colin Matthews and Alan Smith in the Century Property Development Bat produced an impressive display on the Toyota Desert Race. Reliability is a forte for former champion Terence Marsh, now partnered by Peter Krunewald in a Regent Racing Bat. While Nardis Alberts and Colin Hunter are always there or thereabouts in a Red Rapsa Bat. Naim Mosaji and his man Rayan Bodjana and the Total Motorsport Jimco have come up with some impressive performances of late. While Clint Gibson, partnered by Gary Campbell in the Absolute Bat, has also shown good form this season, and they could be the dark horse of the race. Picking a winner in Class A is a risky business. By contrast, looking for potential winners in Class B is simple. The cries in that flying Regent racing back have a perfect record this season, but are now in an area where the law of averages could just be a problem. Their major opposition will come from the consistent Gil Mill and Sandra Labiskachny and the Luke Zarko Truggy. The Adenko bats of Bez beside note and Johan de Brain and Johan and Etienne beside note. Then one shouldn't leave out of the reckoning the KwaZulu Natal crew of Mark Taylor and Derek Keith in the JRE. Swaziland John Thompson and Clinton McNamara and their Zarko could come into the reckoning, as well as load a brain with Rudy Britz and the Roacon back. Hey, yes, yes, sir. An interesting three-way tussle could develop in Class S. Former drivers champion Richard Schilling and Chris Davies have been dominant and will start as favourites in the Plastotech Aceco, but could come under pressure from arch-rivals Nick Gosler and Richard Carolyn in the Kopenhagen Hotel Super Team Raceco. 
It will be a challenging course to tell us more. Here is the clock of the course, Pete Swanepoel. Basically, the event starts with all the pre-event administration in East London itself. Logistics it works the best. The actual event starts in Bishu and then traverses a large part of the Eastern Cape. And the terrain is very, very varied. Very fast stuff, bushy stuff, some very nice indigenous forests. And indeed, we're very privileged to have gone through those, to be able to go through those forests because of the sensitivity of the forest. But it's the non-rainy season, so we can get through there safely. Some magnificent scenery, as I said, over Cutberg Pass, which I think the competitors are going to enjoy, but is something that they have to be very, very careful of. And again, down into those valleys, really a nice route. The African Heritage Cross Country Amatole 500 starts on Friday, the 27th of July, with a prologue and finishes at the race headquarters at the Fisher of the Sun on Saturday, the 28th. And